Okay. Um, I think we are live, just to be certain here. Um, this is the person I'm using StreamYard for this, so I'm broadcasting this on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I have no idea if this is going to work at all. So if anybody is out there listening to this, um, if you could just let me know if my audio is okay. Um, <laughs> if anything else, let's just get started. Uh, just cue up a little bit of some music here. There you go. Well, all right then. <clears throat> Greetings. My name is Farad, and welcome to the 2022 reading of A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. This is a tradition that I that, that, that started 30 years... that I didn't start, sorry. This is a tradition that started 30 years ago in the classroom of Mr. Joseph Scotis of Whitney Young Magnet High School. On the last Friday of the year, before the winter break, Mr. Scotis would invite his current fourth-year journalism students, as well as alumni of his class and, and aides of the school's technology center, as he read this brilliant short story to them year after year. Now, I've attended these gatherings for over 20 years since I graduated from Whitney Young, and for me, it was an indelible part of my, inver of my observances of the holiday season. I took it upon myself to read A Christmas Memory every year for the last few years here on the internet, and I hope it'll continue to be a tradition for me and for you for years to come. Joe would read two items for the holiday gatherings. Preceding a Christmas memory, he would read to his journalism class a newspaper ed editorial that became a holiday classic, as well as a part of everyday referential vernacular. It's about a young girl named Virginia asking the editor of the New York Sun newspaper if there is a Santa Claus. Joe would say that he believed in Santa Claus as a child, stopped believing when he was a little older than most kids, but later believed in him again. This article is a good representation of why that is. This is... Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Dear Editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they see. They think that nothing can be nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared to the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary it would be to the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see him, uh, Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus. But that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that children neither, ch uh, that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing upon the lawn? Of course not. But that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and to see what makes it to see what makes the noise noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived, could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view the picture in its supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God. He lives and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. That editorial was written by Francis Farcellus Church, 
and it's become and it's become the most reprinted newspaper editorial in the history of the printed word. And now the feature presentation, A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. Let me just go to another thing over there. There we go. Turn up the music a bit. Imagine a morning in late November. A coming of winter morning no more uh, a coming of winter morning more than twenty years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature, but there is also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, this fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She is wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly, like a bantam hen, but due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that, and tinted by the sun and wind, but it is delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry-colored and timid. Oh my! she exclaims, her breath smoking the front window pane. It's fruitcake weather! The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven, she is sixty-something. We are cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently, makes us cry, and frequently make us cry, we are not on the whole too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy, in memory of a boy she was, uh, who was formerly her best friend. The other Buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. Excuse me, the courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear, and there were no birds singing. They've gone to the warmer country, yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuit and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to bake. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. The hat is found. A straw cartwheel corsage with velvet roses out of doors is faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine, that is, it was bought for me when I was born. It's made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But, some, but it is a fateful object. Springtimes we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern, and for our porch pots. In the summer we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and roll it down to the edge of a creek. It has its winter uses too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yarn to the kitchen, as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived his temper, and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them, how hard they were to find, the main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Among the concealing leaves, the frosted deceiving grass crackle. The, a cheery crunch, scratch of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and golden mound of sweet oily ivory meat mounts into the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. We mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop, and there's scarcely enough as there is for thirty cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the, in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final hull into the fire and, with a joined sigh, watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty. The bowl is brimful. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, and blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow is the kind of work I like best begins. Buying. Cherries and citron and ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins and walnuts and whiskey and oh so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings. Why, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. 
But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any. Except for skinflint sums persons in the house occasionally provide, a dime is considered very big money, or what we earn ourselves from various activities, holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries, jars of homemade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers or funerals and weddings. Once we won 95th pro 90, uh, 90, uh, 79th prize, $5, in a national football contest. Not that we know the full thing about football, it's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested AM. And, after some hesitation from my friend thought it perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan, AM. Amen. To tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the Fun and Freak Museum we had conducted in the backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington or New York lent us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabouts wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel, kids two cents, and took in a good twenty dollars before the museum had to shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate a Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse underneath a loose bore, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit, or, as it happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I'm allowed ten cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way, I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, sent or received a telegram, read anything except for funny papers and the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished someone harm, told a lie on purpose, let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, does do. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county. Sixteen rattles. Dipped snuff, <laughs> secretly. Tame hummingbirds, just try it, till they bounce on her finger. Tell ghost stories, we both believe in ghosts, so chilling they can, they can chill you in July. Talk to herself, take walks in the rain, grow the prettiest japonicas in town, know the recipe for every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical wart remover. Now what's upper finished? We we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently, wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills, tightly rolled and green as may buds, somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weigh a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters, worn out as smooth, worn smooth as creek pebbles. But mostly, a hateful heap of bitter, odored pennies. Last summer, others in the house contracted us to pay a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August, the flies that flew to heaven. <laughs> Yet it was not work in which we took pride. And as we sit counting pennies, it's as though as we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us have a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start over again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall or put somebody in a cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13ths in bed. So... To be on the safe side, we subtract a penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruitcakes, whiskey is the most expensive, as well as the hardest to obtain. State laws forbid its sale. But everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address, a sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before and on the same errand, but in previous dealings, but in previous years, our dealings have been with Haha's -Ha wife, an iodine dark woman with a bra with brassy peroxided hair and a dead tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too. 
a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him a haha because he's so gloomy, a man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and now with chains of garish gay naked light bulbs and standing by the river uh, uh, and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade of river trees where the moss drifts through the branches like a gray mist, our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Haha's cafe. Cut to pieces. Oh no. Hit on the head. There's a there's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns and the Victrilla wails. But in the daytime, Haha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at a door. Queenie barks. My friend calls M Mrs. Haha, ma'am? Anyone to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself. And he is a giant. He does have scars. He doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan tilted eyes and demands to know what you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we are too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at vest. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like a quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Wouldn't you believe it? Haha is smiling, laughing too. Ha 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 ha! Which one of you is a drinking man? Ha 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 ha! It's for making fruit cakes, Mister Ha Ha. Cooking. This sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadow cafe and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates sparkle in the sunlight and says, Hmm, two dollars. We pay him in nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, as he jangles the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruitcakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home, There's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. The black stove, stoked with coal and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar, vanilla sweet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air, ginger spices it, melting, nose-tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, drift out into the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days our work is done. Thirty-one cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on window sills, and shelves. Who are they for? Friends. Not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the larger share is intended for people we've met only once, perhaps not at all. People who struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt, like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, Baptist missionaries to Borneo who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes to town twice a year. Or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanged waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud whoosh. Or the young Winstons, a California couple whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and spent a pleasant hour chatting with us on the porch. Young Mr. Winston snapped our picture, the only one we've ever had taken. It's because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers, mere and merest acquaintances, seem to us our truest friends. I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time-to-time -time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders, penny postcards, make us feel connected to events, to eventful worlds beyond the kitchen with a view of a sky that stops. Now, a new December fig grant, uh, branch grates against our window. The kitchen is empty. The cakes are gone. Yesterday, we carted the last of them to the post office where the costs of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me, but my friend insists on celebrating, with two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle. Squeenie has a spoonful and a bowl of coffee. She likes her coffee chicory-flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed-up expressions and sour shudders. But by and by, we begin to sing, the two of us singing different songs simultaneously. 
I don't know the words to mine, just come on along, come on along, down to this dark town Strutter's ball. But I can dance. That's what I mean to be a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing, sh my dancing shallow rollicks on the walls. Our voices rock the china ware. We giggle as if unseen hands are tickling us. Queenie rolls in her back. Her paws plow the air. Something like a grin stretches on, the on her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparkly as those crumbling logs. Carefree as the wind in the chimney. Our friend, my, I'm sorry, my friend waltzes around the stove. The hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a parody dress. Show me the way to go home, she sings, her tennis shoe squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Enter two relatives. Very angry. Potent with eyes that scold, tongues that scald. Listen to what they have to say. The words tumbling together in a ratful tune. <laughs> a child of seven? Whiskey on his breath? Are you out of your mind? Feeding a child of seven? L must be loony. Road to ruination. Remember God's and Kate? Uncle Charlie? Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law? Uh, shame. Scandal. Humiliation. Kneel. Pray. Beg the Lord. Queenie sneaks under the stove. A friend gazes at her shoes. Her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt and blows her nose and runs into her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent except for the chimes of clocks and the sputter of fading fires, she is weeping into a pillow already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry, I beg, teasing her toes, tickling her feet. You're too old for that. <laughs> it's because, she hiccups, I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny. Fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be so tired tomorrow we can't go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps into the bed, where Queenie is not allowed, to lick her cheeks. Oh, I know where we'll find some really pretty trees, buddy. And Holly, too, with berries as big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, farther than we've ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there, carried them on his shoulder. That's fifty years ago. Well, now I can't wait for morning. Morning. Frozen rhyme lusters the grass. The sun, round as an orange and orange as hot weather moons, balances on the horizon, burnishes the silvered winter woods. A wild turkey calls. <coughs> A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth. <coughs> Soon, by the edge of the knee-deep rapid running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Wait, I think I... Did I skip that here? Oh, I'm sorry. It kind of skipped that there. Oh, no, that's right. Okay, there we go. <coughs> Soon, by the edge of the knee-deep rapid running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie wades the stream first, paddles, uh, uh, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current, the pneumonia making coldness of it all. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet, a burlap sack, over our heads. A mile more of chastising thorns, burrs, and briars that catch our clothes, of rusty pine needles brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here, there, a flash, a flutter, an ecstasy of shrillings that remind us that not all the birds have flown south. Always, the path unwinds through lemony sun pools and pitch black fine tunnels. Another creek to cross, a disturbed armada of speckled trout froths the water around us, and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the farther shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold but with enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. <sighs> We're almost there. Can you smell it, buddy? She says, as though we were approaching an ocean. And it, indeed, it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly-leafed holly, red berries as big as Chinese bells, black, crow, black crows swoop upon them, screaming. We have, uh, Having stuffed our burlap sacks with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about to choosing a tree. It should be, muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy, so a boy can't steal the star. 
the one we pick is twice as tall as me. A brave, handsome brute that survives sturdy hatchet strokes before it keels with a reeking, creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen. That in the tree's virile, icy perfume revives us, goads us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town. But my friend is shy and noncommittal when passers-by praise the treasure perched in our buggy. What a fine tree! Where'd it come from? Oh, yonder way, she murmurs vaguely. Once a car stops and the rich mule owner's lazy wife leans out and whines, Give you two bits cash for that old tree! Or nearly my friend is afraid of saying no, but on this occasion she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar, the mill's wife owner per persists. A dollar my foot, fifty cents, that's my last offer. Goodness, woman, you can just go get another one. In answer, my friend gently reflects, I doubt it. There's never two of anything. Home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snoring as loud as a human. A trunk in the attic contains... A shoebox of ermine tails off the opera cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age. One silver star. A dilapidated rope. Uh, sorry, a brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy-like light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze like a Baptist window, droop with weighty snows of ornament. But we can't afford the made in Japan splendors of the five and dime, so we do what we've always done. Sit for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and sacks of colored paper. I make sketches and my friend cuts them out. Lots of cats. Fish, too, they're because they're easy to draw. Some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved up sheets of Hershey bar tin foil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. And as a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton, picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effect, clasps her hands together. Now, honest, buddy... Doesn't it look good enough to eat? Queenie tries to eat an angel. After weaving and ribboning holly reeds for all the front windows, our next project is the fashioning of family gifts. Tie-dye scarves for the ladies, for the men a home-brewed lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first sentence of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes time for to making each other's gift, my friend and I will uh, separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries. We tasted some once, and she swears, I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could. And that's not taking his name in vain. Instead, I'm building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so on several million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want. But confounded, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something that you want them to have. Only one of these days I will, buddy. Locate you a bike. Don't ask how. Steal it, maybe. Instead, I'm fairly certain she's building me a kite. The same as last year and the year before. The year before that, we exchanged slingshots. All of which is fine by me. We are champion kite flyers who studied the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a kite aloft when there is, is, or there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butchers to buy Queenie's traditional gift. A good, noble beef bone. The bone, wrapped in funny paper, is placed high in a tree near the Silver Star. Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equaled by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching summer's night. Somewhere a rooster crows, <laughs> falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? It's my friend, calling from her room, which is next to mine. And an instant later, she is sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hoot, she declares. My mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Mrs. Roosevelt will serve our cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Seems like your hand used to be so much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you've grown up, will we still be friends? I say always. But I feel so bad, buddy. I wanted so bad to give you a bike. I tried to sell the cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, she hesitates, as though embarrassed. I made you another kite. Then I confess I made her one, too, and we laugh. The candle burns too short to hold. 
Out it goes, exposing the starlight, the star spinning at the window like a visible caroling that slowly, slowly, daylight, daybreak silences. Possibly we doze, but the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water. We're up, wide-eyed and wandering while I'll wait for others to awaken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of closed doors. One by one, the household, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both. But it's Christmas, so they can't. <laughs> First, a gorgeous breakfast. Just everything you can imagine, from flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the comb. Which puts everyone in a good humor, except my friend and me. Frankly, we're so impatient to get the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Who wouldn't be? With socks, a Sunday... <clears throat> A Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year's subscription to a religious magazine for children. The Little Shepherd. <laughs> it makes me boil, it really does. My friend has a better haul. A sack of satsumas, that's her best present. She's proud as however of a white wool shawl knitted by her married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. And it is very beautiful. Though not as beautiful as the one she made me which is blue and scattered with gold and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is printed on it. Buddy. Buddy. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. And nothing will do until we run out to the pasture below the house where Queenie is scooted to bury her bone and where, a winter's hence, Queenie will be buried too. There, plunging through the healthy waist-high grass, we unreal our kites, feel them twitching at the string as the sky, as the sky fish, uh, like sky fish as they swim into the wind. Satisfied, sun-warned, we sprawl on the glass and peel satsumas and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and the hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we'd already won a $50,000 grand prize in that coffee-naming contest. My... How foolish I am, my friend would cry, suddenly alert, like a woman remembering too late to, that she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I always thought? She asked in a tone of discovery, not smiling at me, but at a point beyond. I always thought that a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagined that when he came, it would be like looking out of the Baptist window, pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through, such a sign that you don't, even, that, that you don't know it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think that of that shine taking all away, away all that spooky feeling. But I'll wager it never happens. I'll wager at the very end the body realizes that the Lord has already shown himself. That things as they are, her hand circles in the gesture that gathers the clouds and kites and grass and queenie pawing over her bone, just what they've always seen was seeing him. As for me, I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide I belong in a military school, and so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim revelry-ridden summer camps. I have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, kitchen al alone with Queenie, then alone. Buddy dear, she writes in her wild, hard-to-read script, Yesterday Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture, where she can be with all of her bones. For a few November, she continues to bake her fruitcake single-handed. Not as many, but some. And of course, she always sends me the best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show. And write me the story. But gradually, gradually, in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more, thirteenths aren't the only day she stays in bed. A morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning, when she cannot arouse herself, herself to exclaim, Oh my! It's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing me from an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite in a broken string. That is why, walking across the school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky, as if I expected to see, rather like hearts, a lost pair of kites hurrying toward heaven.
This is the first time I'll be reading this. This is the, this is the first time I've read this story since Joe's well-earned retirement this past June. And I hope I can continue to do so for years to come. My thanks to Joe for starting his tradition and to his students, as well as to Whitney Young alumni, alumni, and alumna for taking part in it year after year. Thanks also to Truman Capote for the lovely memory, Francis P. Church for the editorial for the ages, and most of all, thanks to you, all of you for joining me. I wish you the happiest of holidays and all the best in the year 2023. Until next time.